I am only wanting to tell you about the pathetic condition of environment in the sociology. And that's your topic. Probably you didn't understand <laughs> the manner in which I have developed my topic. You will all be hearing very interesting things which you want to hear. But please, why is it that we are in such a predicament now will have to be understood. Now the research committee, we also, the Indian Sociological Society also has a research committee, it's modeled after International Sociological Association. It has a, a research committee, Environment and Society, out of uh, some 24 of them. And it's not very popular. I was looking at the data. I think uh, hardly 30 persons, and we have a live membership of 3,000 people. Not more than 30 persons are members of the research committee on environment and society. In comparison with some others, for example, there is a research committee, gender and society, which has about 300 people. See, knowledge production and dissemination is very, very interesting. There lived a man called P. A. Sorokin. I don't know if you have heard about him. He wrote a book, Facts and Foibles in Social Sciences. Just like your dress pattern change, <laughs> the facts and foibles and disciplines also change. So, gender and society, or women in society, is a very, very popular topical area of research. Nothing wrong about it because it has been neglected for so long. But as compared to that, look at environment and society, only a handful of people are interested. In my search to locate, identify environment in sociology, I came across only very few studies. So, when you invited me, uh, you thought I had just come and told me I did a lot of hard work. I already showed it by <coughs> telling you some facts. And um, in India, Indian sociology and social anthropology, what are the most widely researched area is village studies, along with family and kingship, religion and symbolism, etc. But the Indian village ethnography, I mean, if you read the earlier photographs, they will tell you flora and the fauna, this, that, and the other climate. But did any one of them really describe the environmental condition of Indian village? I don't remember, I read most of them. But the man who really took cognizance of that is not sociologist, the big name that I have reeled out, but a man called Mohandas Karantin Gandhi. Well, I always say that these days if I say Gandhi, most of you may end up at wrong names, places. Karantin I would like to, but then he said, tell me so I say Mohandas is the easiest, <coughs> so that he is not misunderstood. I always say Mohandas Karanchan Gandhi. So he wrote, and he was wanting to create Ram Swaraj. He wrote an Indian village. These are all brought together, published. There is a small book called Constructive Program. I think it is published from uh, Namjeev and Publishers, Ahmedabad. And in that he writes, and I quote, Instead of having graceful hamlets dotting the land, we have dung heaps. Often one would like to shut one's eyes and stuff one's nose. Such is the surrounding dirt and offending smell. 1948. But did any sociologist bother about it? Because they were all going there. And because of participant observation, the important thing to do it. They have been living there sometime up to a year, if not more. Some of them were visiting again and again, but none of them were bothered about the environment. Even now, in spite of such Bharat, <laughs> you all know that, the situation is not much different, not only in village, but also in uh, urban areas. My, my suggestion to you is, Sociologists in India have been largely impervious to the phenomenon of environment and ecology. Let me get back to the theme. 
There was a virulent discussion in Indian social science, not only in sociology, on what is called the mode of production in India, mode of production in India. Of course, Marx long ago talked about the Asiatic mode of production, etc. But the ecological dimension was largely ignored. If you go to the Northeast, you will suddenly come across what is called terrace cultivation. But if you go to the coastal area, the cultivation is quite different. The nature of cultivation is certainly conditioned by the nature of the land, the terrain, the ecology. But let me tell you two exceptions here. <coughs> Anand Chakravarti, who was teaching in the <coughs> Department of Sociology in the Delhi University, refers to the unique condition of the ecology operating in Purnia district in Bihar. In a couple of papers he published in Economic and Political Weekly, 1986. And Christopher Hill referred to the ecological evolution of sharecropping system in, again, an EPW article. This is not a sociological journal, it's Economic and Political Weekly. In fact, um, uh, Anand Chakravarti refers to the ecological dimension of production as compared with the mode of production uh, debate. That is, the mode of production can be conditioned by ecology. But this argument did not gain much currency in Indian sociology, although I have located these two just to illustrate my point. I have not come across many sociologists referring to that. So this is another very curious thing in our discipline. If you venture to a new area, instead of being encouraged, you will be stigmatized. I am a victim of that. I cannot go into <coughs> my biography here, but that's a fact. But don't be deterred by that. Do your innovations. Sometimes somebody will recognize How do we locate the emerging tracks? This can be discerned in the context of new social movements, which is a, a cluster of movements consisting of feminist, ecological, environmental, peace, and aut autonomous movements. The cluster we are interested in now could be designated as the Green Movement. We are familiar with the Green Movement. However, the origins of uh, uh, the origins of green movement, which is usually referred to as postmodern, is occasioned by ecological imbalance and <coughs> environmental degradation caused by the urban industrial civilization. The proponents of the green movement were uh, Prince Kropotkin, a Russian prince, Leo Tolstoy. Again, the Russian, Henry David Thoreau of the US, and Mohandas Karantin Gandhi of India. These were the people who first argued for the need to keep a balance between humanity and nature imperiled by urban industrial society, a product of modernity. But contemporary green movement has its locus in Germany. Again, an industrial country. And they have even, as you know, a green party. Ecology or environmental movements are non-class, non-political, non-violent, as their locus is habitat or locality. So in a particular locality, both the genders will be there. All age groups will be there. All classes will be there. And usually, these green movements are nativist, communitarian, regional, and insular. If you talk in terms of uh, the problems of ecology, invariably, although there could be comparisons elsewhere, it is confined to a particular locality. It is also important to remember the crystallization of ecological or environmental concerns gained strength in the context of reckless production 
and application of high technology. A lot of people are dealing with environmental, te environmental concerns, movements, technology, will not deal with the importance of technology. And the first document that is available to us is um, a document referred to as Limits to Growth in 1972, published by uh, the Club of Rome. Limits to Growth. They are trying to argue that we are going to face a great catastrophe, which of course has now fallen on us because of the, the uh, irrational production and uh, application of high technology. And uh, then there was the report by the World Commission of Environment and Development, 1987. This has crystallized our ecological consciousness. I refer to some of the anarchists the world over, including Mohandas Karamjan Gandhi. I refer to the limits to growth and also the publication of uh, the environment uh, by the World Commission, United Nations Agency. There is one interesting development which happened in India. Again, I don't know whether you are aware of this. The publication of State of India's Environment. State of India's Environment, a citizen's report, published in 1982. That indicates concerns about environment. But, and that is my point, sociology and sociologists are absent from all these. Whether it is the Club of Rome, or whether it is the World Commission on Environment and Development, or even India's, State of India's Environment. There is no sociologist, even as a consultant. Paradoxically, nature worshippers of India has a strong uh, past in terms of Indian tradition, particularly I'm referring to Adivasis and Dalits, who sacralizes Mother Earth and consequently protect nature. I mean, if you, if you study again, all our village studies have not really gotten into that. I come from originally, let me say, a place called Kerala, where there were a lot of groups protecting. That's one way of protecting nature. So, our Adivasis, or tribal people, and Dalits, or scheduled caste people, used to sacralize Mother Earth. Consequently, they used to protect nature. But Hinduization of Adivasis and Sanskritization of Dalits drain them of this orientation. Not only that we have not frontally taken on the importance of Mother Earth, but those categories which we are doing were discouraged to do it. Sim similarly, cosmocentrism of uh, traditional India, which respected all entities in the universe, has gradually eroded. Now, we have come to have what is called homocentrism. Cosmocentrism is a much wider notion, where the universe is taken to be as one, unique. But we don't bother any, anymore about cosmocentrism. We are only bothered about uh, homocentrism. The situation in the West is equally bad. The West has discarded its ancestral Christianity and invoked modern high technology after 17th century to exploit nature. Again, if you have uh, read uh, Robert Merton's uh, <coughs> Science in 17th Century England, you will understand what I'm trying to say. Please remember that the Judaic value orientation, that means the value orientation of Judaism as a religion, was first formulated in Palestine in 9th century BC. But after the development of modern science and technology in the 17th century, Christian era, Christian West abandoned its traditional value system and played havoc with nature. Jesus has taught that economic greed was incompatible with service to God. Again, Gandhi said, there is Enough for everybody's need in this world, but not for 
greed in this world. Jesus condemned the accumulation of capital, a rash development of technology, but all these is forgotten today, even in Jesus and Mary College, I, I suspect. Let me conclude, because some of you are showing some restiveness, isn't it? That's, I suspect, as I look at it. <clears throat> what is the way out? What can sociologists do? I have done it again. I don't want to propagate what I have done. But let me very, very briefly tell you how sociology can rescue environment or ecology. As I said, the universe can be seen in terms of three dimensions. The first dimension is simply matter. And that's what physicists are. I understand the principal subject was chemistry. Huh? So people like her or physicists are. It's a one dimensional phenomenon. I always tell people when I lecture on methodology and social science, the easiest thing to study is physical sciences because it is one dimensional. Then came life sciences. Life sciences study two dimensions. Matter and life. Plant has life, Jesse Bose told us. Of course we know animals respond to music. So again I can elaborate, I will not do it. So the universe I said has three dimensions. One is the material dimension. And second is that dimension which is biotic in nature. Material plus life. Two dimensions. Plants have life, animals have life. But then comes the third dimension. We, the humans, we are all biological beings. When you have uh, a heart problem, you don't go to a sociologist, you go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. So, we are made up of cells. We are also biological beings. But what is distinct about human being is that he or she has culture. So we are three dimensions. We have matter with us, we have life with us, and we have culture with us. And because of this three dimensionality, the study of society and culture is much more prominent. What I'm trying to suggest is so far we have, as sociologists or social scientists, have completely neglected the importance of the physical environment as well as the biological environment or biological being. It is quite possible to argue that our social cultural life is conditioned by both by the ecology in which we live and also by the biological beings with whom we interact. Why should you drink cow's milk and not lion's milk? <clears throat> you can think about it. So, if you really want to understand the universe in its totality and to locate sociology in that as a discipline, social science in that, we must take into account both the ecological as well as the biological dimension to have a complete understanding of the social cultural sphere, which is the business of sociologists to study. And unless such a revolutionary step is taken. I don't think sociologists will have much to contribute to the understanding of environment and ecology. I think I will stop now. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
so now we begin with our uh, panel discussion on the theme of environment development and politics. Our panelists for today are eminent scholars from different universities. I would take this opportunity to introduce them one by one before we begin. Our first speaker in the panel is Professor Sabesachi from the Department of Sociology, Jamia Media Islamia. Professor Sabesachi pursued his MA, MPhil, and PhD from the University of Delhi. He started his teaching career in 1993 and has published extensively on ecology, tribes, and forest communities. His last book is entitled Between Earth and the Sky. His long years of fieldwork amongst tribes of central and eastern India enabled him to work on the idea of community-based cultural heritage preservation. He has also served as traveling faculty for the Rethinking Globalization program coordinated by the University of Boston. Professor Sadasachi, it is a pleasure to have you here. Our next speaker is Dr. Sudha Vasan, Associate Professor at the Department of Sociology, Delhi School of Economics. Dr. Vasan pursued her MS from Purdue University and PhD from the Yale University. She has served as a visiting fellow at the Australian National University and Ruth Glass Fellow at the London School of Economics. Her research interests include social and political ecology of the Himalayan region, environment and development, reproduction of gender, caste, and class inequalities through social and cultural capital. She is the author of Living with Diversity, Forestry Institutions in the Western Himalaya. A very warm welcome to Dr. Vasan. Our third panelist for the session, our third original panelist for the session, Dr. Jayadeep Chatterjee, unfortunately could not be here with us today uh, because of a medical emergency at his end. Uh, therefore, Dr. Padma Priyadarshini has kindly agreed to speak in the panel on the same theme. Uh, Dr. Padma Priyadarshini is...